This video includes a paid sponsorship from Novium, but I'll talk more about that later. Now that Tesla has solved the last major 4680 manufacturing technology breakthrough, what improvements should we expect from Tesla's 4680 batteries in the near future? More energy density? Faster charging? Stick around as I discuss what 4680 improvements I expect in the coming months, including info from a recent Tesla patent application. I'm John, and this is CleanerWatt. After five years of really hard work, Tesla finally solved the last major 4680 technology breakthrough, which now allows them to start finally realizing the massive cost savings promised at battery day. That breakthrough is of course Tesla finally solving the dry manufacturing process for the cathode side of the battery. And as Bone Eggleston, who heads up the 4680 program for Tesla confirmed on X, these cathodes were, quote, fully made by Tesla on our mass production scale dry electrode machines. Now I will get to 4680 battery improvements that I expect in the somewhat near future, but there are a few new details that have emerged since my last report that I need to cover about dry cathodes. It appears like Tesla may not yet be manufacturing these dry cathodes at Gigafactory Texas, but rather at their Cato Road facility. While the Tesla Cybertruck with these dry process cathode batteries was captured by Joe Tegmeyer at Giga Texas, when Tesla on the official Cybertruck X account posted this image, it was at their Cato Road facility, and apparently that's the same Cybertruck that showed up at Gigafactory Texas. So since Tesla made this announcement with a Cato Road battery team, I'm guessing that's where they manufactured these dry cathodes because of course that is their pilot facility. That's where they figure out technologies. And then once they figure out the technology, they then use that learning to build out the production, the mass production facilities at Gigafactory Texas. So with this information, it may take a little longer to ramp up the dry cathode process at Gigafactory Texas than I initially thought because they likely have to still install some new equipment and get that up and running. And it's highly likely that when Lars mentioned being on track for the production launch of dry cathode batteries in Q4 of this year, that this launch will initially involve cathodes manufactured once again at that Cato Road facility. Tesla very likely will be manufacturing these dry cathode rolls at their Cato Road facility for a little bit, and they'll be transporting those over to Gigafactory Texas for final assembly. And of course, I could be wrong, but that's my take on this. Either way, the dry process appears to be solved on the cathode side, and this should allow Tesla engineers to now focus on improving the battery cells, which is what I want to discuss next. But before I do that, this portion of today's video is sponsored by Novium. Now, in addition to the amazingly cool Interstellar Edition hover pen, Novium also sent me their Future Edition pen, which has a two-in-one fountain pen rollerball configuration. And as much as I like the Interstellar Edition hover pen, the Future Edition pen is my new favorite, and I'm a big fan of how well it writes. With its two-in-one fountain pen rollerball design, you can easily and quickly switch between the fountain pen or the rollerball insert, and you can use this pen for many years because hover pens are refillable. With a fountain pen head installed, you can choose to use the pre-filled cartridge or instead use the included refillable insert and use your own liquid ink. Like the Interstellar Edition, this Future Edition hover pen has great style, a high-end feel, is comfortable to hold while riding, and in addition, it's fun to spin as it stands magnetically in its base. Novium does offer this pen in a deep black color, the frost silver color that I have, and mist blue. In addition, hover pens come packaged in a really nice box and would make a great gift for yourself or someone else on your list. Find out more by clicking the link in the video description and enjoy a 10% discount and free shipping to most countries on all hover pens with code CLEANERWATT. So now that Tesla has solved the last major manufacturing breakthrough, those same engineers can now focus on improving the batteries themselves. And when I say improving the batteries, a lot of that comes down to improving the energy density of the cells and also in turn improving the charging performance of the batteries as well. Now, when it comes to the potential for the energy density of Tesla's 4680 battery cells, at battery day back in 2019, Tesla claimed a 54% range increase would be possible with all of their technologies. Of course, a portion of this had to do with the cell-to-vehicle integration, which I'll talk about shortly, 
But the first generation 4680 battery cells when it comes to energy density and charging was quite disappointing. And of course, the cyber cells are 10% more energy dense than the first generation 4680 battery cells, but apparently there still is a lot of room for improvement. So based on the best available information that I have right now, I estimate that the second generation cyber cell, the cells that are in the cyber truck right now, have an energy density at the cell level of 256 watt hours per kilogram. While that number is a good improvement over the first generation battery cell, it's of course still less than my estimates for the Panasonic 2170 batteries that are in the Tesla Model Y, for example. So once again, going to that battery day slide, you can see that of that 54% range increase, which once again, I've mentioned this in past videos, but when it comes to the range increase, that directly relates to improving the energy density, not only at the cell level, but also at the pack level, but nonetheless, improving the energy density of the battery cell, potentially both volumetric and gravimetric, so weight and volume. And when it comes down to this, when you break this down, 14% of that increase was for the cell to vehicle integration, but 40% of that increase was cell level energy density gains. So I assume that the baseline here that Tesla used, that this is increasing over and above, is for 2170 battery tech and where 2170 battery tech was in 2019. So even if a 40% improvement over 2170 battery tech isn't realized, I still see a path for Tesla to achieve somewhere around 300 watt hours per kilogram for their next generation battery cell in the not too distant future. And one of the big ways that I believe Tesla will be able to do this is by incorporating more silicon into the anode of the battery. And a recent Tesla patent application, I believe actually applies to this particular aspect of Tesla improving 4680 batteries. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I've talked about it a lot in past videos, but when you add silicon to the anode of a battery, that does increase the charging speed and does improve the energy density as well. However, silicon expands quite a bit when it has lithium ions in it, and that expansion problem actually causes cracks in the anode material, and you have to actually accommodate for that. So that's one of the reasons why we don't actually have full um, anodes made with silicon. If you were able to do that, and there are companies working on those kind of technologies, and if you're able to do that, you would have faster charging speeds and greater energy density. However, you have the problem with short battery life with a silicon problem. It looks like though, Tesla, not only with some of the technologies they've talked about at Battery Day, the way they talked about the highly elastic binder and uh, electro design there on this particular slide, but it looks like with this Tesla patent application, which is for a multi-layered electrode. It looks like that might actually help with adding more silicon to the anode as well. Now, with that being said, according to two reports, it looks like Tesla has already implemented a small amount of silicon into the anodes of their 4680 batteries. One report comes from James Ma on X, and I've talked about that in the past, and his analysis came from a second generation 4680 battery cell that was found in a Model Y. And in the past, I called this a generation 1.5 battery cell. It wasn't quite a cyber cell, but it was an improvement from the first generation battery cells we initially saw in the Model Y. So that battery cell apparently had a small amount of silicon in the anode. And according to this Monroe Live YouTube video, based on their analysis of a cyber cell, it looks like the cyber cells actually have a little bit of silicon in their anode as well. But nonetheless, at Battery Day, Tesla mentioned a potential for a 20% range increase with their integration of silicon into the anode of the 4680 batteries. So this could be a big deal if Tesla realizes what they discussed at Battery Day. Now this Tesla patent application was recently published entitled Compositions and Methods for Multi-Layer Electrode Films. In this application, a problem is described that can lead to a loss of power delivery and loss of energy storage capacity in the battery. And I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit, but basically what's described here is with a battery electrode, for example, on the anode side, you have the metal foil and then you have the active material which is a graphite material usually with a typical um, anode. And that graphite or that active layer can actually have issues with poor adhesion 
which causes it to really not be connected to that current collector very well anymore. And then what happens is when that happens, that leads to losses in power delivery and energy storage capacity. With that being said, here's where silicon comes into the picture. When it comes to exactly what causes this, in this application, it's written, quote, it is thought that volumetric changes in the active materials may contribute to such processes. For example, additional degradation may be observed in electrodes incorporating certain active materials, such as silicon-based materials, that undergo significant volumetric changes during cell cycling. So to really encapsulate the problem here, you have certain materials like silicon that actually are really good when it comes to energy density, but they have the problem of volume expansion. And you want to incorporate that into the battery, but you also want that battery to last a long time. So in this patent application, as I'm going to discuss, a multi-layer approach is described. And in my guess, the silicon rich layer would be in the middle, as I'll discuss. And you'd have this multi-layered approach here, and that would kind of encapsulate it and keep it from being disconnected from the rest of the electrode active materials. And then you would do the higher adhesion materials um, on the top and the bottom to kind of hold that together. But nonetheless, it looks like the traditional wet process that would be used for traditional manufacturing would not allow for a multi-layered design at least as easily as Tesla's dry process because in this application, it's described that quote, in wet film forming processing, such as for example, spraying, slot dye, extrusion, and printing, the substrate may limit the possible combinations of active layers under some circumstances. Further, wet processes may suffer from limited material choice and the resulting wet process electrode films may also suffer from non-uniform dispersion of constituent materials, for example, active materials. The non-uniformity may be exacerbated as film density is increased and may result in poor ionic and or electrical conductivity. Wet processes also generally require expensive and time-consuming drying steps which become more difficult as the film becomes thicker. Thus, the thickness of an electrode film produced by a wet process may also be limited. Of course, Tesla is not limited by using a wet process because they solved, for example, recently the dry process on the cathode side of the battery, and they've been able to manufacture their anodes for quite some time with their dry process. So Tesla is not limited by the wet process limitations, and apparently the dry process is much more uh, capable of doing a multi-layer design like this patent application describes, which allows them to have better performance and kind of optimize the battery for what they want here. So in this application, some aspects of the dry process are described, including the use of PTFE as a binder and the fact that no solvents are used when manufacturing the electrode film. In addition, it's written, quote, dry electrode fabrication may be advantageous in making multi-layer electrode films. Dry electrode fabrication allows self-supporting, for example, freestanding active layers to be generated. Generally, these active layers can be combined as needed to achieve a set of desired operating characteristics. Thus, self-supporting active layers can be stacked without limitation as to the method of fabricating the individual active layers. So when it comes to some of the benefits of this multi-layer electrode, it really comes down to a balancing act with a battery cell. Once again, if we're talking specifically about a silicon-rich anode material, you have a problem with the expansion that I believe leads to that anode material really not having good electrical contact after a while with the current collector or that metal foil. However, if you put that silicon rich anode material in the middle layer of, for example, the electrode, I believe that could make a difference and you could have the right binders in there, similar ways that was described at battery day with a silicon rich anode material. But nonetheless, you could put that silicon layer, for example, in the middle layer and put the other two layers with less silicon or no silicon, but still benefit from having silicon in the anode of the battery. So for our example here, I would refer to the silicon layer as a lower adhesion layer and other layers as a higher adhesion layer. And it also could be that they add more binder to that lower and upper layer and they add less binder to the middle layer. And even if they didn't use silicon, that would still be a benefit. But nonetheless, as it's described here, quote, for example, the order of active layers may be selected such that higher adhesion films are adjacent to current collector. For example, lower adhesion active layers may be sandwiched between higher adhesion active layers such that the effect of the lowered adhesion, for example, to a current collector is reduced. 
So once again, this dry manufacturing process allows Tesla to do things like this, where they can actually have this multi-layered approach. And I'm not saying it can't be done with a wet process, but it apparently is a lot harder. So this dry process makes it a lot easier and allows Tesla to do this kind of technology where they are apparently, I'm guessing they're going to use this mainly for adding silicon to the anode, but I'm sure there are other ways they can use it as well. With that being said, this seems to be related to something that Joe Tegmeyer wrote about on X.com earlier this year. And that was specifically asymmetric lamination of electrodes for Tesla batteries. So this post is from January 3rd of this year, and specifically Joe wrote about chemistry changes in 4680 batteries coming in the future. And in this post, he also wrote, quote, they are also trialing asymmetric lamination with one side of the laminated material thicker than the other. The expectation is this will increase the amount of jelly roll that can fit into the 4680 can. Interestingly, when I was looking through the images included in this Tesla patent application, if you look there at figure 3B, you can see that appears to be an example of asymmetric lamination. On the top of the current collector, there are two layers drawn there, but on the bottom of the current collector, there are three layers. So that appears to be asymmetric lamination, once again, something that Joe Tegmeyer wrote about back in January. Now, going back to Tesla adding more silicon to their 4680 batteries, when you add more silicon, not only does it increase the energy density of the battery, as I just discussed, but it also should improve the charging performance of the battery cell as well. Now, the Tesla Cybertruck has decent charging speed as is. It's kind of middle of the pack. If you look at this particular chart here, and this is from the Out of Spec Studios website here, and I will link to it down below. And I definitely recommend you check out the out of spec YouTube channel and their website here. As you can see, when it comes to how much 70 mile per hour range is added per minute of charging for various trucks, including the Cybertruck, the Cybertruck is really kind of middle of the pack here. So if Tesla is indeed able to add more silicon to the anode of their batteries, once again, I would expect that the Cybertruck charging speed would improve. And although it does have a smaller pack, than the rest of the trucks on that chart, I believe it would rise up quite a bit and be even more impressive and will hopefully be able to take full advantage of V4 supercharging speeds in the future. With that being said, I wanna go back to that Joe Tegmeyer post on x.com from January. And just as a reminder, when it comes to things that we should expect changes with Tesla's 4680 batteries, it also appears like Tesla is working on a higher nickel cathode chemistry, which once again should increase the energy density of their batteries as well. Nonetheless, as Joe Tegmeyer summarized here with the cathode changes and the asymmetric lamination, it looks like there could be an energy density increase with the 4680 battery changes that Tesla is making somewhere between 10 and 20%. So with that being said, if Tesla's next generation 4680 battery cell is indeed 20% more energy dense than their second generation cyber cells right now, which once again, if you add more silicon to the anode and you increase the amount of nickel in that cathode, I believe that's very possible, a 20% increase. That could lead to the cell level energy density of that third generation cyber cell over 300 watt hours per kilogram, specifically here somewhere around 307 watt hours per kilogram. And when it comes to how that would affect the range of the cyber truck, for example, the dual motor all wheel drive truck with all season tires, while that version right now gets 340 miles of range, that could very well boost that range to over 400 miles of range in the future. I don't know how long it's going to take Tesla to implement these improvements into the cyber cell, and we could have to wait a little bit for this as they really make sure that they can ramp up this dry process on the cathode side first, but I do expect these changes or similar changes to come in the future based on what we can tell, and it may be that there are step changes here. It may not be that Tesla jumps completely to third gen cells that have 20% more energy density, but there may be an in-between stage. But nonetheless, I do expect energy density and charging speed improvements in the somewhat not too distant future for Tesla 4680 batteries. I would love to know what you think about all this in the comments section below. I'd also like to say once again, thank you to Novium for sponsoring this video. Remember to check out the amazingly cool Novium hover pens by clicking the link in the video description and enjoy a 10% discount and free shipping to most countries on all hover pens with code CLEANERWATT. Well, thank you so much for watching this video all the way through to the end. I'd also like to say once once again, thank you to all of those of you who support me through Patreon. Your support makes a big difference and does help make these videos possible. If you'd like to find out more about how you can support my work through Patreon, I will put a link in the video description. Thank you so much.